Yeah, and I want to acknowledge uh, Nathan Nelson, who uh, I, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years talking about these kinds of ideas. I think the previous two speakers were talking about you know, different ways of visioning about what the future of the P-Index is. Uh, this is just another perspective and another way to look at thinking about where we are currently with P-Indices and where we're going into the future. Uh, you know, one of the things, oops, one of the things I think we, it's important for us to understand is that the P-Index is really a relatively young uh, technology. You know, and if we think back about other technologies that we use in nutrient management, we need to recognize how long it takes to go from the inception of an idea to the actual fully blown implementation of that idea. And, and we hear a lot of people as they talk about the P-Index about, well, my state, you know, that's it's literally a, a piece of legislation is never going to change and I and I think it's important to, to, to consider you know really the full weight of what that really means and you know soil testing is a you know loved and and uh, and I mean it really it, it's 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 a historic uh, approach in terms of nutrient management you know the first research that was talking about using chemical extractants to predict crop response and fertilizers you know came from the 1850s and really kind of blossomed in the 1880s and 1890s it was literally a, nearly a century from that first work till we had the release of the current test that we use today like the um, you know, Bray 1, Malik 3, they, that came out of work from the 1940s and 1950s. And then, um, you know, and, and then, you know, now in the 1980s, uh, 1990s is when we've had the, initial, the initiation of the environmental assessment era. So the point is that it can take a while to go from a concept of the science to the point of how do we then agree on an effective way of implementing that, that process. If we look at the timeline of P management tools, I know uh, uh, Andrew talked about this a little in the beginning, but you know the initial research from the 70s, uh, and note, note some of the names here, looking at connecting uh, soil test phosphorus to runoff water quality came uh, from the 1970s. It was another 20 years to having the development of that first P index framework from you know, the work that many people in this room are familiar with, Will Munyan and Gilbert's paper. And, um, you know, and then now as we get up to t 2008 is where the regulations started saying we're going to require PLOS assessment. My point is, is that in terms of this process, we're only 40 years into that process of that initial concept to implementing that tool. So we should recognize that this is still a young technology. We've only really been working with P indices as a concept now for about 20 years. And, uh, you know, so it shouldn't surprise us that there's some fundamental work that still needs to be done in trying to translate a concept into something that works effectively across fields across the U.S. <clears throat> you know, I have an observation about the P-Index. It's a terminology that's kind of like apple pie. I mean, everybody thinks they have a vision in their mind, I like apple pie, uh, you know, they but you know they and they have a their sense of what it means but when you start digging down into the specifics of what individual people think about what the p index is doing it's actually there's some pretty big differences and there's so if you look at the actual tools and i'll talk about this a little later there's some fairly significant differences about what our individual p indices do and there's also quite a bit of difference as you talk to individuals what they think p indices are supposed to do um, so I would say that we have a tremendous opportunity as we start looking at our P indices to start sharpening our approach, thinking more critically about what we're trying to do with our individual tools. And, um, and you know, so there's an opportunity there uh, to, to, to uh, maybe sharpen where we are with that. <clears throat> so there's a lot of things that we can look at as we start thinking about looking to the future of improving our P loss assessment tools, uh, you know, moving towards a regional approach or uh, larger scale areas, uh, focusing on user capabilities, that's where I'm going to focus today, uh, clarifying the water quality goal, really what Deanna was talking about, um, clarifying the temporal context of what we're working with and whether that temporal context is appropriate to what you're trying to accomplish. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. 
uh, you know, tools that promote voluntary adoption. This gets a little back to this issue about user care capability. You know, are they tools that, um, and then the idea about do the tools have applicability beyond the newer? Those last two looking at, you know, can we get out of the world of regulation into the world of, uh, of a, a, a tool that's accepted as a, an important part of management of all fields. <clears throat> Um, one thing that is, I think is for people who work a lot in the field of nutrient management is obvious is that, you know, the nutrient management is not about calculating a rate. It's about the process of how you make a decision. Now that's sometimes lost as you move into the regulatory world. The regulatory world, which dr has driven a lot of the things around the P index, you know, is focused on that manure application rate. They want to focus as, on that as a, as the outcome, but really, as we talk about what are we trying to do with nutrient management, we're trying to, to put in place a decision type tree or some type of process and provide a way that, that users make, uh, that the, the user of that plan makes decisions. You know, the actual outcome of the P index of those rates that are in there, it's really more of a feasibility document. We know that that manure applicator or that farmer is going to make changes from what there is in their plan to what they're going to actually do when they get out there. And so we know as we write a plan that as we finish that plan, that strategic plan looking to the future, that there's going to be changes that come along. You know, we're, the plans are typically one to five years depending on what state. There's requirements of soil testing. Actually, some states go down as low as annually, but three to five years. So there's going to be new information coming in from soil test results. Uh, regulated operations are required to manure test annually. And P loss assessment, you know, the time scale of that is, is, is quite a variable from state to state. So we have information coming in over time. So we know as a fact that the future application rate can't be known because it's based on time system of in information. So it's important uh, that we recognize that, therefore, that our planning process is a strategic process looking at, at what, is, what is feasible. And then if we start to break out the, P and the, 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 the fully implementing a nutrient management plan, most of our efforts up to now have focused a lot on the strategic planning component. Sitting, in, sitting down with a farmer, typically with a, uh, uh, you know, with a, um, a consultant, or uh, frequently with a consultant, looking at you know, what are the long-term goals and mapping out some type of strategy to attain those goals and planning out sort of on a regular basis where, where you would be putting manure into that plan. But we need to recognize, and this is where we're moving to now, is we're starting to recognize, well, as somebody implements that plan, they need to have tools that allow them to make changes and strategic changes looking at, uh, so this, this is still a, a strategic planning, uh, <clears throat> we need to make some tactical planning adjustments to our strategic plan because we have new incoming information, new ma manure test results, new changes in the cropping system. I couldn't plant corn this year, so I planted soybean. You know, there's adjustments that have to be made. And then there's a third level of uh, sort of implementation, so we've gone from strategic to tactical to implementation, where we have somebody with a manure spreader, they're heading out to a field, they have to make decisions about is today the right day to apply. So really as we pull together the whole nutrient management planning process, there, we have to address all these different levels of planning. Um, there's a range of capabilities out there of people that are working with the nutrient management planning process. Uh, I work a lot in training certified nutrient management planners. I mean, these are people that have some real uh, capabilities. They've been trained in specific tools. For example, nutrient management software, uh, Russell 2, which is an erosion software from NRCS. Uh, they have experience in sophisticated nutrient management uh, planning strategies. They're very well versed on these topics. And these are the types of people that are, are developing our strategic plans. Um, we're also working with farm managers who are, are still familiar with computers, but they may not be well versed in some of the nutrient management tools. In fact, they typically are not well versed in that. Um, they're clearly very good at strategic planning. They're running a fairly complex business, but they're not necessarily familiar with the specifics of nutrient management. We have a whole other group of folks, contract or professional manure applicators. 
in the Midwest, these people are becoming much more important in terms of people are working with, uh, they're often the ones that are uh, trying to implement a plan. They're getting the new, they, they're getting new information. They, these guys have a range of uh, computer skills. Some are well versed in computers, others are not. They're very experienced at the tactical assessments associated with spreading manure and implementing the manure. Um, but they may not be familiar at all with the process of developing a nutrient management plan. And then you have uh, farm workers who on many farms are applying manure, who again are experienced in implementation but may not have, again, computer skills or familiar with these tools. So these, this is your, your workforce, and obviously you have to take that into account as you think about, I have various steps along the way, am I putting somebody in a position to make a decision with a tool to make a decision that reflects the capabilities of the people that are out there. So, um, you know, that's really at the heart of what we're talking about. And this is basically, as I look at um, who do we think is going to be on board or available for various steps. In the st strategic planning process, you know, it's fair to accept, expect to have tools where we have a dedicated planner. Though there, as we move into voluntary adoption, there's going to be more and more many, many individual farmers or smaller farmers who are not going to want to hire a dedicated planner. And so we need to recognize that tools that work for strategic planning are going to be more effective if they drift into being able to work across into a farm manager level, uh, not just with dedicated planner. As we move to tactical planning, essentially making adjustments on a year by year or season by season basis, um, it's Certainly on larger operations, it's fair to expect maybe a dedicated planner might be involved with that, but on many farms, that type of management is going to fall to a farm manager and a contract applicator. And as we work with sort of day-to-day -day decisions about manure application, it's really unfair to have tools that are focused on uh, needing a dedicated planner there that's just not going to be there. You need to have tools that are uh, fit towards the, are dedicated to contract applicator and farm workers. So then we go and step back and look at the types of, of nutrient management tools that we have. Uh, this is just a survey of some states' uh, P indexes. I'm just, I didn't pick these for any particular reason, uh, but showing um, what I want to focus in here right now is looking at how they estimate erosion. And many of these states focus on using uh, Russell 2, though some states focus on using Russell alone, uh, our, uh, the, the USLE, revised USD, not Russell 2. Um, <clears throat> I'll get more into some of, the, some of the complexities over here, but I think it's important to look at this barrier with the, what I call the Russell 2 barrier in terms of being able to effectively uh, use a P index. This is a real challenge uh, as we have management changes in a field. How do we get over the Russell 2 barrier? Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is as we look and hear people suggest other types of tools that might be used as P indexes or used for assessment, you know, you hear, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, we have water, we have different tools out there, I mean, from uh, long-term regional stress, we have watershed models and nutrient balance, you know, the, their complexity is fairly high, nutrient balance is, is, is less complex for that. But as we get into field and tactical risk, you know, we hear about the nutrient tracking tool, APLE, as ways of maybe supplanting, moving to a more complex tool to do a better job with P indexes. But we need to recognize that we're going from something right now, which is already a mo low to moderate complexity, up to something that's higher complexity. So the point what I'm trying to say is as we look to the future, and we think, oh, well, more complex tools will do a better job. We need to recognize at the same time we're making those tools more difficult to be used by the folks that are out there. And we're, in, in fact, limit, more limiting how effective they're going to be in terms of the fact we're reducing the pool of people that will be able to effectively use those tools. So, you know, in my world, from my perspective, ideally we're going to have strategic planning tools that, that fit in this world, tactical planning tools which are simpler, and then implementation tools that are uh, contract applicators. Well, my experience with Russell 2, and I'm used to training people on a simplified version of Russell 2, which exists inside of the manure management planner. 
You know, basically, uh, you know, we take a two-hour session where we sit down with people who are well familiar with uh, nutrient management planning and walk them step by step through uh, working with uh, Russell 2. And at the end of that, and along with the booklet that's with that, most of those most of those uh, folks are able to pick up and manage to be able to do that. Um, uh, we work, my program works a lot with developing uh, online software to help support nutrient management. I'll just say that we're not even thinking about trying to get Russell 2 into our web-based planner because it's just so complex. So one of the issues that we have with, nutrient, with our P indices is that as long as we're focused on in having something as complex as Russell 2, we're essentially locking ourselves into something that requires a, uh, a fairly, a, a fairly a, a high level of technology to get that thing done. So, um, so basically, that's my, my pitch on focus of the user capabilities, is that one of our key challenges as we move forward, I think, is actually not to get more complex. It's actually to figure out how to get where we need to be with simpler tools, uh, particularly as we move which we have to move into. Right now, we're focused, we have focused a lot on tactical plan, long-term tactical planning, I mean strategic planning. We have not done as good a job at once somebody has a plan, how to implement it. And we won't be able to be successful with that until we get over that issue. I want to talk a little bit about uh, temporal context because I think these two topics are related. I want to focus over here looking at, you know, so everybody has a P index. Uh, but each of those P indexes actually does quite a, quite a few different things. So, you know, some P indexes deal with timing of applications, some don't. Some, we have quite a bit of difference in terms of apparent time steps. So Iowa apparently looks like it works by year. Uh, Kansas is by year, but you're supposed to pull out the highest year in a five-year plan. Missouri, we evaluate over a five-year plan, average annual loss over a five-year plan. Maryland by year, Mississippi by year, uh, North Carolina, most erosive year in a five-year plan. So a lot of these are one-year time steps. But as you look at some, um, like Indiana and some other P indexes, some of those folks focus on individual uh, applications. Um, <clears throat> as we look at the kind of information that we're working with as we develop uh, uh, our plans, um, basically, as you look at a strategic clause, and also, Andrew, where am I on time? Uh, okay, so as we look at, a, at a, as we look at, at developing um, a plan, our strategic clause, what kind of information do we want to be looking at? So in our strategic planning, we're interested in sort of long-term average rotational losses, either on an annual or a seasonal basis. As we move into tactical uh, planning. We're interested in valuing places, plans maybe based on seasonal forecasting or on, uh, on annual, uh, long-term annual or seasonal losses. And obviously as we get into implementation, we're interested in short-term uh, weather, weather forecasting. <clears throat> so as we work now looking at uh, uh, testing out our P indices, P indices, we're getting information from our watershed studies that are basically event-based losses for locations. <clears throat> and then we're trying to use models then to take this type of information to generate you know, long-term averages losses by year. And then on some of our P indices, we then try to average those losses across year to look at an average rotational loss. So uh, the main point that I'm trying to point out here is just as we look as we worked in developing our P indices, as you look at uh, developing uh, our strategic tools, there's going to be user, different user capabilities. You're probably going to be using, and then as we move to more tactical plans or we move to our implementation, our tools are going to be using different types of information, uh, different types of runoff information, different types of weather-based information uh, in order to put those tools together. So I just Finally, just turn back to talking about agronomic soil testing as a model. You know, basically that's a tool. Uh, it's a field level strategic assessment. You know, basically what fields will respond to phosphorus? What fertilizer rate should I apply to that field? Um, you know, the potential users is farmers and consultants. 
it's a tool that's very easy to train a farmer and a consultant, somebody who has very limited uh, background to go out and appropriately sample a field. And then we provide them the results back in a way that's very easy for that level of consultant to assess what the information is and make a decision. So I think as we move forward and we think about our P indexes, I think we really need to take a step back and, and think through that process, think through the fact that we have uh, different people at the table at different times, and take it as an opportunity <clears throat> that we're not trying to, to develop uh, the P index, but we're really trying to develop a suite of tools that are targeted at key, inf key information groups information points, and those tools are going to differ dramatically in the types of things that are, they're going to use it. My favorite, since I do work in uh, software development, I like to say our tools can be complex, but they must be simple to use. So, uh, so I, that's, that's kind of my mantra in this area. So thanks for the opportunity, and we look forward to the discussion.